hand of God. Okay. You know, our Father teaches in such a way that is so simple, in the simplistic way that Christ taught. And let's talk about the Hebrew alphabet for a moment. The tenth letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Yod. And what does it mean? Well, it means hand. Why? Because it's shaped like a hand. The very smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, but shaped like a hand. And the very word hand in the Hebrew tongue is yet. I, I like for you to look at it this way. The Y is the first name in the first letter of the sacred name. And then comes the valve. And then the last letter is the leet. The leith is always a door. In other words, the first alphabet, all it meant was like A was an ox, B was a house, and, and uh, D, the door to the house, Gimel, a camel. And what it looked like it. Okay. Is that simple? So simple. And, but there you have Va, the uh, Wa, and then you have the O, the valve, and then the door. I can't help but think when I think of that concerning the hand of God where Christ would say in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Knock with what? His hand. Okay. Any man that opens the door and hears his voice, that's important. That means hears with understanding. Not just to hear a sound, but to know what he's talking about. If he opens that door, I will come in. And sup with him, meaning I will share the deeper truths with you, which they themselves are the simplicity. Let's take the very next letter in the Hebrew alphabet, 11, which is uh, judgment and disorder. It's cough. Why? Because it's shaped like the palm of the hand. And it means the palm of the hand. That's, that's what it signifies. And naturally, um, you don't want that part of God's hand on your neck. OK, that's that judgment comes kind of swift with him. So but with that having been said, it is so marvelous the way Christ and the father teaches. Now, let's go to the great book of John, chapter three, if we may. St. John, chapter three. And um, we're going to pick it up, if we may, in verse um, 28. Verse 28 reads, "Ye yourself, this, Incidentally, let me fix the stage here. This is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle speaking. This is John the Baptist who was to come, as it is written in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, in the spirit of Elias, which is to say Elijah, the truth that would return. And this is that same John the Baptist who was later beheaded speaking. Verse 28 of chapter 3, St. John you yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. What it was, there were a few people there saying, trying to create a little jealousy between them saying, hey, you've always baptized a lot of people over here, but there's one over here that his people are baptizing a lot more people than you are. Trying to agitate a little bit, stir a little trouble. But John, being as humble as he was, said, hey, I told you. I'm not the Christ. I'm only the forerunner. I only deliver that message. Verse 28, 9. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. This is what I was waiting for. Is for that truth to be delivered. That's what you should be waiting for today. Is the word of God. Almighty God. And the hand of God. To touch. To be in control. Because his hand. You know after all. He created the heavens and the earth with his hands. If his hands are with you. Who can be against you? No one can. He's in charge. He's in control. And that's what John is relating here. You. You couldn't make old John was so humble, you couldn't make him jealous. He said, this is what I've been waiting for. This is what we wanted was, was the Lord. Verse 30. 
He must increase, but I must decrease. Verse 31, he that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. That's what you have to listen to. Hey, incidentally, where did you come from? Hmm? Did You came down from the Father, right? Then you ought to be at least some good. Okay. Because everything that comes down from heaven is heavenly. When you follow him and obey him. So you need to separate yourself a little bit from that that is earthly. And listen to that voice. That voice that was crying in the wilderness here. But the very voice of he that knocks at the door. Open the door of your heart and let him in. He will feed you. He'll sup with you. You won't want for any knowledge or wisdom. He will fulfill those things. Have you ever asked him? That's what it takes a little bit on your part. You've got to open the door, friend. Well, I, I heard the sound. I, I heard the knock. Well, you didn't open the door. You have to do a little bit on your own. You have to open the door to your heart. Let him let that word in that voice and then he will feed you and you will have that truth, that knowledge. He will sup with you. Verse 32 and what he hath seen and heard that he testifieth and no man receiveth his testimony. Uh, you don't receive it if you're going to stay earthly. OK, you got to open up. Verse 33. Listen carefully. This is why we came here. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. Do you have the seal of God in your forehead? That seal is the truth. It is God's word. Now, do you know what God did to, when he came as Emmanuel? He came with us. And what did he give the office of Savior? Verse 34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Didn't just give him part of it. Verse 35, the Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. There's your key word hand again. He gave, gives that word, the, everything into the hand of Christ. Therefore, when Christ touched something, it changed things. When he touched for healing, for leading, for guiding, God had put all things in the power of that hand that would heal, that would lead, that would guide, that would direct. And that's why you can, well, after all, wasn't he Emmanuel, God with us? Is that not God's hand or is it not? Okay. So God, in that office of Savior, Put all power in his hand. That's why you want to follow him. That's why you want to open that door. The door to your heart and your mind. Let him in. And let him sup with you. Feed on the scriptures with you. Verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life. That's eternal, that is. But the wrath of God abideth on him. That's that old, the cough, which is to say judgment and disorder. It can come into your life if you, if you um, abuse that that uh, is at the door where he knocks. And you let him in. And he sups with you. He loves you. Do you, do you understand? That's why he died on the cross is so that you could open that door. And let him in. That's a, that, that shows love like a man can't muster. But he can. Okay, go with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 23. And Mark being the youngest of the apostles, he moves along vivaciously. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with you, thou Jesus of Nazareth? 
art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. In other words, these evil spirits had come from above also. But they were evil. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. You see, why would they have to obey that? Because all power was placed in the hand of Christ. And when you as a Christian stand and make that stand and do it in the name of Christ, that power amplifies through the whole body of Christ how beautiful and how precious it is. And they have no choice. But, um, and as Jesus would tell them, hold thy peace. Verse 26, and when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. 27, and they were all amazed in as much that they questioned among themselves saying, what thing is this? They hadn't seen this before. It was new. What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. They had no choice. Why? Because of the hand. God had placed all power in his hand. They had no choice whether above, below, or somewhere in between. They had to obey him. Verse 28, and immediately his fame spread about abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. We'll get a little, little rest time here. We're, we're going to be in, in um, Simon Peter's home here. But what's happening here? Verse 30, but Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever and a noun, that's to say instantly, they tell him of her. Now, th this would be Peter's mother-in-law. She has a fever. Watch what Christ does. This is important. Simple, yes. It's the simplicity in which he operated. And forthwith, when they were come out of, I'm sorry, verse 31. And he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her and she ministered unto them. What did he touch her with? His hand to her hand. And he touched her. And that hand had the power, both spiritually and otherwise. Why? Because God had placed all power in that hand. And her hand then was able to minister. That, that means she served them. She took care of business. That's the way our father acted as he was in the body of the son, which is to say, Emmanuel, God with us. And that power is such a powerful thing. And that's why he stands at the door and that's why he knocks. But you've got to do your part. And you know something that was just not opening the door, cut it. You had to hear his voice with that means here. That word in the Greek means with understanding. To know what he's talking about in the simplicity in which he taught. Let him into your mind and heart and be blessed by the living God. Okay, let's go, if we may, to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Verse 17, Christ has been keep, keep, uh, put, casting out demons here and, and some Kenites came up and they said, hey, you're doing that in the name of the devil, Beelzebub. You're not doing that in God's name. And observe how Christ handled this. Verse 17 of Luke chapter 11. And he, that is to say Christ, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom is divided against itself, is, is brought to desolation, and a house divided against the house falleth. It can't stand. In other words, 
I, if I'm with the devil and these devils are here and I throw them out, I'm fighting my own people here. They weren't his people. Okay. They were only accusing him of that. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. That's king of the dunghill. That's Satan himself. 19. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. We got a problem here. Their sons couldn't cast out devils. Why? Because most of them followed the devil. There was no way. They'd never seen such a thing before. Therefore, he puts them on the spot. He nails them right there. Okay. Verse 20. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Do you know what the finger of God is? It was the finger of God in Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, in Exodus chapter 31 verse 18 that wrote the two tablets of the law that keeps us out of trouble. That finger of God is the presence of the Holy Spirit himself. And with that finger of God pointing directly at them, he ordered them out and they had no choice other than to go. Well, how could he do that with the finger of God when he was Christ? Because God placed all power and authority into his hand. And he had that authority to exercise that authority and power. The finger of God, which is a part of the hand. You know, in, in, in Hebrew, they have no uh, numerals. The letters not only as they are, yeah, identify certain objects and things, places, they are numbers. And the tenth letter is naturally stands for the number ten. You got ten fingers on your hands, okay? And and uh, and in the Greek tongue, it becomes a part of. It comes from the word tenth, okay? The hand does, kerus, which is comes from. Chasma, which is the very gulf that splits in uh, Luke chapter 16, comes from that. The hand of God. So beautiful and so simple the way he teaches. A lot of people would say, well, that's sure deep. No, it isn't. It's so simple if you see a hand, that's what it's talking about. Okay. If you see the gulf, you see judgment and disorder. You know what's coming. So God teaches in such a way that you can't really go very wrong. So with the finger of God, which means the hand of God, by the power he had put placed in the son's hand, he was able to exercise this wickedness away from them. He says, that's how I can do it. Verse 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. In other words, he's hoss enough, he can, he, can, he can take care of things. 22, but when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. What does that say to you? Let's analyze it a moment. What it's saying is when Satan tries to come into your life, Christ is a lot stronger. He's showing you, I can crush him. And in my name, you can too. You can take care of business. You know, you know how to take care of things. And a stronger is one that is with God and the hand of God, the finger of God that exercises those powers in his name. Then you are hoss enough. You can take care of business. You can manage. You can show. You can lead. You can guide. You can direct. Why? Is it you doing it? Not really. It comes from the hand of God. Verse 23 to complete. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. The Antichrist is coming. And that is the message. 
That was the message that Christ taught, was defeating Satan's house. Satan is the Antichrist. You will make that stand. And you have the power and the authority to do it. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And the Holy Spirit guides and directs you. All power was placed in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you want him in your heart and in your mind. That's why you want to follow him because in his name, you're tied into that authority and that power. It is wonderful how God, let's, let's talk about what his hand has done for a moment. And let's go to the Old Testament, chapter, Isaiah 45, if you would, please. Isaiah chapter 45. God is talking about here, <clears throat> I'll use whoever I want to. He's talking here about Cyrus. Cyrus was not an Israelite. But God named him before he was ever born. And God used him. Used him to guide Israel out. God will use whomever he so chooses. So this is, this is what God is talking about here is Cyrus, whom he chose. And God is saying, you want to listen to me. You know why? Let's pick it up in chapter 45, verse 11. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker, was the maker of Cyrus. Ask me, in Israel also, and ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of what? The work of my hands. Command ye me. If you want, insist on it. Understand what my hands have done. And the power of my hands. Verse 12. I made the earth. And created man upon it. I, even my hands. They're the hands of God again. My hands have stretched out the heavens. And all their host have I commanded. Do you understand that's talking about your father? I don't care who you are. He's the father of all. That's who we're talking about here. He created all things. And he created them for your pleasure and his. That's why you want to make sure that you give him pleasure. That was the purpose he created you. Well, how do I do that? Tell him you love him. Let him know that. Don't be shy about it. Okay, skip on down to verse 17 in this. Uh, same chapter, 45, 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with, with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. That's forever. For, this, for thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. Listen carefully. He created it not in vain. It was beautiful. It wasn't all torn up. The earth's plates were still together. Therefore, there were no earthquakes. They weren't divided. They didn't run into each other. He created it not... This word is tuhu in the Hebrew, and it means uh, void, nothing. He formed it to be inhabited. It was beautiful. He had it all laid out where man could have really had it made. I am the Lord and there is none else. There's nobody else that can help you like he can. His hand is so strong. Created all. Do you know something? They even created you. That's why you're here. Is he created man. And you happen to be a human. Therefore, he is your father. He is the creator of your soul. That's why your soul. If we were to go back to Isaiah 18, 4, it would say all souls belong to God. You know why? He created them all. You, you don't get around to giving yourself to God. He's got you. Okay. Why? Because he loves you. And that's why he created you was for his pleasure. So 
he created this to be inhabited whereby it was pleasurable for everyone. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, that's all the tribes, seek ye me in vain for nothing. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They, they have no knowledge that set up the wood in their graven images and pray unto a God that cannot save. They, they don't know that, but God did send that Savior in all the world. Let's go one more verse, 21. Tell me, tell you. And bring them near. Let, yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from ancient time. From the very beginning. Who hath told it from that time? Hath not I the Lord? Of course he did. And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me. Be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God. And there is none else. And so it is. Now, in conclusion, I want to go one more place. It's prophecy. Hasn't happened yet. And you're living in the time that it's beginning to form. That's why you want to be alert. Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Again, as you go, you're going to see none of this has happened yet. Some of it is beginning. Chapter 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Of course, Jesse was the father of David, and from David came that Messiah. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of God, which is to say the reference of God. I don't know, are you lacking any of those things? That's where it comes from. You need to make note of that. Hey, the earth will lead you astray. Man can lead you astray. But this one never will. From that very stem comes that truth, comes that knowledge. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. That's the reverence. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. God doesn't do that. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. And that's what he judges by. That's what he's saying here. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. That's the humble. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. The wicked one is who? Satan. Okay. He's got power over him, and you can rest assured in that. That's what he's coming for. Did it say he's going to destroy some of the good, those that even try? No, it didn't. It said the wicked. So that lets you know where you should stand. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. He's solid throughout. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. You think that has come to pass yet? You let... Um, you let a lamb lie down with the wolf and see what happens today. Okay. That lamb's not going to be for long. Okay. It hadn't happened yet. So this is future. This is the way it's going to be. Why? Because he's going to make it that way with his own hand. It's going to come to pass. There's going to be nothing to offend. And that child shall lead them. Seven. And the cow and the bear shall feed, and their young one shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw with the oxen. In other words, the lion is no more a carnivore. Spiritually, he's changed. Okay. And, um, and uh, has the same spiritual food that that spiritual cow will, 
was consumed. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of an asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. This is a statement meaning there's nothing there that can hurt. Even a, one of the most harm, uh, the, the uh, less protected thing in the world is a baby child. Okay. I mean, if they don't have a mama or a daddy or somebody to protect them, they're in a heap of hurt. So they're, they're right in the snake's den, they're going to be all right. Right in Satan's camp. Why? There's not going to be any hurt there. He has taken care of that. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Everyone's going to know. Everyone's going to be taught what a wonderful time that's going to be. And in that day, what day is that? Future. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign, a guide on, of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. I don't care who you are. Glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand, there's the hand of the Lord again, he shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros, Pathros is lower Egypt, and from Cush, that's Africa, and from Elam, and from Shinar, that's Babylon, Iraq, and even Iran of today, if you move the border there a little bit. And from Hamath, that's the land of the Kenite. And from the islands of the sea. It's going to happen. What's going to happen there? Well, let's read it. 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel, and gather them the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. It's going to happen. We're beginning the millennium here. Okay. Uh, and, and so it is. Much of this starts at the sixth trump. So you can be prepared for it. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. There'll be no jealousy. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, that's the migratory ones. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hands upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Why? Because Christ is with them. Because the hand of God is there, and they see it. They know he loves them and leads them. All these places that we're mentioning here, there's not good news from there today. Christians kind of having a rough shake of it in some of those places, as well as many people of different peoples, different beliefs. Even many Islamic people suffer because of the terrorists and the extremists that come up among them. It's going to end. There's going to be peace there. This is prophecy, my friend, in case you're not aware of it. The locusts are buzzing. This takes care of it. This is how it communates that brings to pass the, the conclusion of this particular period of time and leads you into that time when the lamb shall lay down with the wolf. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. That's the Euphrates. And with his mighty hand, wind shall he shake his hand. There's his hand again. What's he going to do with his hand here? It's not to pet. It's not to caress. His hand, he'll shake his hand over the river. That's the Euphrates. And shall smite it into seven streams and make men go over dry shod. In other words, there's not going to be any border between Israel and Babylon, the Tigris between Iran and Iraq. It's going to be peace. There's going to be peace everywhere. And they shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, that's Syria today, like 
as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. What was that again? Did, don't read over that. So it's going to be, do you know how God delivered the children from Egypt in the first time? He said, this is going to be the second time. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to deliver them. But he's not only delivering Israel, he's delivering everyone into the kingdom of God. That that peace will reign supreme until Satan is released that short little season at the end of the millennium. That last verse, I don't want you to read over it. That's prophecy a second time as it was in the days when I brought the children out of Egypt. I'm going to do that again. I'm going to deliver all peoples. I'm going to deliver them into this wonderful condition that we have spoken of here. Let me tell you something, my friend. That's a, that's a place you want to be a citizen of. You want that eternal life. Because this earth is a wonderful place. When he's on the throne and in charge totally and completely. When we destroy Beelzebub, when we destroy Satan, when he does, we're not, we may assist, but we're not the ones that destroy him. He'll get, he can get it done. He doesn't need our help in that. And that's what we have the lake of fire for. And that time is coming. So this is prophecy concerning the nations. Observe it. Mark it well. Open your eyes to what's happening today and be concerned and know and understand your father and the father of all is on the throne. And he's going to see that these things come to pass. He promised it. I believe it with all my heart that it comes to pass as it's written. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for your promises, Father. We claim those promises, Father. We accept them, Father. Use each and every soul in this room, Father, to thine own will and way. Let them be a blessing to all they come in contact with, Father, the children of the living God. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Amen.